Chapter 11 Well, Uncle Beasley kept on growing. According to Dr. Zimer's notebook, he was six feet nine inches long and weighed 360 pounds by the 20th of August. And at the end of the month, he was an even nine feet and weighed 798 pounds. He was so heavy now that we had to give up the two bathroom scales, and instead we used the old hay scales down in front of Beeman's feed store. When we walked Uncle Beasley down there every day, people would come out on their front porches and watch us go by, and all the kids in town would follow along behind. They didn't come any too close, though. Uncle Beasley's horns had begun to grow, and he looked something like an armored tank with guns sticking out the front end. Mr. Beeman, who runs the feed store, always came out on the platform to watch the weighing. Morning, doctor, he said. Hello there, Nate. What's the reading this morning? I slid the balance weights along the bar until it balanced. Eight, nine, seven, I called to him while Dr. Zimer wrote it down in his notebook. That was the 2nd of September, I remember. What you gonna do come winter, Nate? Mr. Beeman wanted to know. That animal of yours is gonna use up a power of hay when the grass gives out. Have you got a shed for him, or can he stay out in the cold weather? Don't know, I said. I never had a dinosaur before. Dr. Zimer didn't say anything just then, but later on that day the doctor had a talk with me. Nate, he said, when does your cold weather begin up here? Oh, the first frost comes about the middle of September. Why? He looked pretty serious about something. Well, there's something you ought to know, he said. You see, dinosaurs are reptiles, and they're not built for very cold weather. You know what turtles do in the winter, don't you? Sure, I told him. They go down to the bottom of the pond and dig into the mud and just lie there all winter. Right, said the doctor. They don't eat and scarcely breathe at all. You see, reptiles are cold-blooded animals. That means they don't have any way of heating themselves. When cold weather comes, reptiles just get cold and they slow down to a stop. Some of them can't live in a cold climate. It may have been the cold weather at the end of the Cretaceous period that killed off the dinosaurs. Dinosaurs lived in a hot climate and although Triceratops was the last of the horned dinosaurs, I doubt if even he could stand a New Hampshire winter. Well, I'd expected this right along, but I kept putting it off. The way you do when the end of summer comes along and you know that you've got to go back to school pretty soon, but you keep putting it out of your mind because it's so dismal to think about. I had a hunch that Uncle Beasley wasn't made for winter since he didn't have any fur or anything, but I hadn't said anything about it because it looked as if it would come to just one thing, that I wouldn't be able to keep my big old dinosaur much longer. Dr. Zimer looked at me for a while, and when he went on, about the only thing to do, he said, is to keep him indoors during the winter in a clean, warm, well-ventilated place, and I don't think your mother's going to want him in the parlor all winter. No, I guess not, I said, feeling pretty glum. And then there's the matter of feed, Dr. Zimer went on. We've used up just about all the available grass in the neighborhood, and when that's gone, we'll have to start buying feed for him. He doesn't like hay. We've tried that. So it's going to be expensive during the winter, trying to satisfy a dinosaur's appetite. Well, what can we do? I said, knowing pretty well what he would say. The only thing I suggest is to ship him to a zoo or a museum where he can get proper housing and food. This whole thing has been a lot of care right from the start and you've worked hard at it and you've made a real pet out of this dinosaur, but the situation is getting too big for you to handle by yourself. We're just going to have to ask other people to help us, but it's going to be hard to give him up though, isn't it Nate? I had to swallow a couple of times. Yeah, I said. I turned away and started kicking against the trunk of the maple tree. My eyes felt sort of funny, but I didn't want the doctor to think I was crying or anything like that. 
He stood there for a while, rubbing his chin with his hand. I tell you, Nate, he said, why don't you go over to the lake and see if you can hook a few fish for supper? Take Joe Chimpigny along with you, why not? I've got a few things to attend to this afternoon, and when you come back, we can talk this over again. Oh, er, is your father over at the shop? Yes, he is, I said, and went across the street to get Joe. We got our rods and the bait can and started down to the lake. When we got to the boat, I put in the two sash weights I use for an anchor, and then we pushed off. We rowed out to the middle of the lake, and then Joe slid the anchor into the water. It went down out of sight, and then some bubbles came up after it touched the bottom. We baited up and dropped in our lines, and then settled back with our feet up on the gunwales. It was one of those kind of slow, quiet days that come at the end of summer, when everything feels sort of still and peaceful. You could see a little touch of red here and there along the shore where a maple was beginning to turn, and a couple of crows were calling over on the far shore. You could hear the sounds coming over the water. Joe felt a nibble and pulled up his line. The worm was gone as usual. Those sunfish are too smart. He baited up again and threw in his line. The ripple went sliding out in big circles. What's the matter, Nate? Joe said. You look kind of sour. I've got to send my dinosaur away to some museum, I said. They can't stay out when cold weather comes. Gee, that's tough. Can't you keep it in a shed some place? You should use the Simmons' old carriage house. Too cold, I said. Dinosaurs are cold-blooded. They've got to have a heated place. That's what Dr. Zimer says. Ah, uh, you could try it anyways. Why not? I shook my head. I better not. It might die. And then how would I feel? I promised Professor Morrison that I would do everything I could to keep it alive. I guess I'll just have to give it up. Too bad, Nate, Joe said. Well, maybe sometime I can go to the museum and see Uncle Beasley again. He'd probably forget me, though. We had fairly good luck, and by the time the sun began to get low over the trees, Joe had three middle-sized bass, and I had two perch and a nice bass, and a pound and a half, I should say. We tied up the boat and walked back to town. Dr. Zimer was going to stay for supper, Mom said. She told me to get busy and clean the fish, and we could have them for supper. I got a bucket of water and sat on the back steps to clean the fish. Cynthia came out to peel some potatoes. I know something you don't know, Cynthia said in a low voice. All right, sis, I said. What is it? Blueberry pie for supper? Nope, she whispered. Nothing to eat. It's something about you. I heard Dr. Zimer talking to Mom and Pop about it this afternoon. Well, what is it? Can't tell, she said, and started peeling another potato. How about a hint, then? Just a little one. Come on, sis. Well, it's about you and... Cynthia, Mom called out. Don't give away any secrets now. Remember what we told you. I wasn't, Mom. I was just making Nate curious. I wasn't going to tell him anything. Honestly, I wasn't. Well, all right, Mom said. Hurry up with those potatoes now. Let's have those fish, Nate, and don't forget to feed the chickens. Cynthia, you run out and pick me about a quart of wax beans, will you? The ones down at the far end of the row are the biggest. Supper was finally ready, and we all sat down and watched while Pop served out the bass. It was mighty good, and just about enough to go around, and then there were the perch to fill in the corners with. And we had boiled potatoes with melted butter running all over them, with a little parsley on top, and the wax beans had that real fresh taste to them and Mom had made corn muffins. I just stuffed myself till I was about bursting. Finally, I had a little more time to look around, and I noticed that everybody was sort of exchanging glances across the table. Dr. Zimer raised his eyebrows and looked at Pop, and Pop nodded back at him. Ahem, the doctor said and wiped his mouth with his napkin. Nate, if you can interrupt your eating for a few moments, I have a little proposition to put to you. Here it comes, I thought. He's going to offer to take my dinosaur away with him. 
You remember, Nate, that we talked this morning about taking care of the dinosaur over the winter, and you agreed that there wasn't any place here that would be suitable. Now, I have a suggestion, and I'd like to see what you think of it. If you are willing, we could ship the animal to Washington, and we could keep it at the National Museum. You could still be the owner, but the museum would provide you the feed and the living quarters. What would you think of that? I suppose that was nice of the museum to offer to do that. It was pretty generous of them to keep Uncle Beasley for me and feed him and take care of him, but it still meant we would be a long way apart, and I'd probably never get a chance to see him way down there in Washington. I guess I didn't look any too enthusiastic about the idea, but when I looked up at Dr. Zymer's, his eyes were twinkling, and the corners of his mouth were twitching a little. And of course, Dr. Zimmer went on very calmly, it is understood that you would come along too, because we need your help in handling the... What? I shouted. You mean I can go too? Oh boy! But then I remembered there was more to it than that. I looked at Mom and Pop to see whether there was any chance that they might let me go. I was pretty sure there wasn't much hope for that, of course, but it wouldn't hurt to ask. Could I, Mom? I said, it would be awfully good experience for me. Couldn't I go? You heard what the doctor said. He said they needed me to take care of Uncle Beasley. Well, what do you think, Walt? Mom said. She didn't sound as flustered as I expected. In fact, neither of them looked very surprised at the idea. I wondered if they'd talked it all over ahead of time. That must have been what Cynthia was talking about. I guess Nate's old enough to take care of himself for a while. I think perhaps we can manage around here fairly well without him. Of course, he has been doing a lot of chores around the place. I think he could get Joe Chimpigny to take care of your chores. Nate, like the stove wood and the chickens? But that would cost money, wouldn't it, Pop? I would have been glad to pay Joe myself if I had enough money, but I didn't. You could pay Joe out of your salary, Nate, Dr. Zimmer said. But I don't have a salary, I said. You will have. The museum will pay you $25 a week for your services, and you can pay Joe out of that. Gosh, I said, that would be wonderful. When do we go? Dr. Zimmer rubbed his chin. Well, the museum needs a little time to get ready for a dinosaur, and we've got to arrange for one of our trucks. I should say we wouldn't be able to leave for almost a week. Oh, I said, but school begins the 9th of September. That wouldn't give me very much time at the museum, would it? Only a day or so. But that's better than nothing, of course. Naturally, I didn't want them to get the idea that I didn't want to go or anything like that. It just did seem too bad that school was going to begin so soon after I got down there. Oh, by the way, Nate, Pop said, as if he had just happened to remember something. I was speaking to Mr. Jenkins, your school principal today, and he said that if you needed to take any trips during school time to help out for your dinosaur, he would excuse you from attendance for, well, I think it was four weeks, he said. He felt that there was so much you could learn from the experience that it would be worth the time lost from school. Really? I said. Oh, good for Mr. Jenkins. I didn't think he had it in him. Well, it wasn't entirely his own idea, Pop said, with a look at Mom. And he made a rather strong suggestion that you keep up in your schoolwork while you're away. Oh, I will, I said. I'll work twice as hard as usual. I'll wager you could, too, without straining yourself. Mom said, Cynthia snickered, but I felt too good to kick her under the table the way I usually do. If you're studying science, Dr. Zimmer said, we have some men at the museum who will be able to help you a little, and you can learn a lot wandering around in the museum. The Smithsonian Institute is just across the mall from us, and so is the Arts and Industries Museum, and the National Art Gallery is just a block down the street. Then, of course, there's the Library of Congress, and the Capitol, and the Supreme Court, and if you like astronomy, there's the Naval Observatory. I think we can see that your education is not forgotten completely. Gee, I said, 
You mean it's all worked out so I can go down to Washington for a whole month and I'll get paid for it and can even skip school? Boy, am I lucky. I must be dreaming or something. I felt so good that I never even noticed what we had for dessert. And that doesn't happen very often.